Talks. My name is Brian M. Davis. I am your host of this lovely little podcast. Joining me today is a lovely actress. Alexandra. Alexandra is a New York performing artist, actress, uh, mostly actress, right? Yes. All right. Uh, in terms of your performing arts, uh, what is your background, essentially? Like, how long have you been acting or just general performance, uh, performance stuff? I have been in theater since I was maybe around 12 or 13. That's when I first started um, professional theater. So I joined a professional program for young adults. And with that theater company, we started touring and doing things in Colombia. I'm from Colombia, South America. So that's when I started. Uh, uh, could you tell us a little bit about if, uh, what the differences between Colombian theater is compared to say, I guess, American theater or maybe even New York theater is like, how is the, like, how is the, the process there compared to like, say up here? Yeah. I mean, I think it's very different. Granted, I've been here for about 10 years, so maybe it's changed back in Colombia. But back when I was there, um, I don't think musicals are that big, or at least not back then. They were not that big. So Broadway was sort of a foreign market for me because I didn't understand that musicals were obviously different than a play. Um, so it was definitely more play driven versus musicals. So I think that would be the main difference, I want to say. Hmm. Uh, in terms of, so you mentioned that you were joining theater at, at the age of 12. Was it, uh, did you go to a performing school there or was it something that, uh, like your junior high slash high school, you know, theater club that was doing, or was it like something that was like progressing more and more from like a hobbyist to like something that was like more and more hey, I, I, I want to do this. So it was a professional program. So I knew since a young age that I wanted to be a professional actress. So um, I asked my mother to find uh, like a more formal um, educational program for theater versus just a few classes that I've taken at school. Um, and she found this great program. It's called Deca Teatro. And they cater to young adults. So pretty much if you're under 19, but you're a professional mm -hmm. actor, they cater to you. So they work. It was very full time. So my school was definitely very flexible with me because it did take a lot of time off from school. Um, so obviously, as long as you are making your assignments and you know, your grades are good, they allow you to do that. But it was a very, very full time uh, two year program for anyone from like yeah, 12 to like 19. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you just said it was a two-year program, so you pretty much served the full two years, or yeah, yeah. did you? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so when did you come? Well, I don't want to say like I'm trying to phrase it into a way that says. So I'm trying to phrase it in a good way, so I don't want to like, uh, like stumble as I say it. But <laughs> when, when you arrived in America, how did you see, like, the transitioning from how you were from in Colombia, the way the uh, the theater was there, to where essentially, hey, you know, there's so many opportunities as an actress, especially in New York City or in LA or where, where, you know, somewhere else. It's like, how did you see like everything essentially shift from being what you were originally charged to essentially, hey, this is now much more my normal routine now? I mean, it was a big change. It was definitely a huge change. I've, um, so the way that theater company worked back in Colombia is after your two year program, you would be able to audition to formally join their theater company, not just huh. like, um, you know, after, the, um, the two-year training, you could join the company if you audition, and I was very, very lucky uh, to get chosen. I was able to attend, um, and we would tour around the city with whatever, you know, play or show we would put on, so I think I was a little spoiled, so to speak, because I was young, and I was, you know, always a part of this company, so I didn't 
have to audition as much out of it. Um, it, it, it was very easy within the company to get roles from other places. They would, you know, help you with that. But then I moved here by myself. And of course it was like, nobody's doing that for you just cause you know, just to help you. Um, so it was a big change in, in that sense. I had to learn a lot about the business itself. Um, and I think I'm still learning, you know, there's still every day there's new things. And now with COVID, the whole industry is changing. So there's going to be even more new things to learn. Uh, so it was definitely a, a big challenge on the, on the learning curve because I didn't, you know, I was working on my English and of course I was still taking acting classes. I've only done theater before. So once I moved here, I wanted to do on camera classes. But then on top of that, I had to take like marketing for actor classes and business for actor. You know what I mean? Like that type of, um, of education that you obviously didn't get in a different country and the market here is so different. So that was probably the biggest challenge was more on the business and, and the, the industry itself more than the technique or even the language. Yeah, th and that's a lot of things that actors really don't know a lot is the business end of of acting or rather just theater and film in general, where it's like you need to have an agent, you need to have like a like almost like a casting agency or, you know, that sort of thing. Auditions are so cutthroat, even because even with the uh, auditions that I had in college, they were pretty cutthroat and they were, and they were pretty much geared towards favoritism, you know, that sort of thing. But I, uh, but in a more professional setting, auditions are much more uh, cutthroat, like, the, the, and people are a lot more, it's like, you don't have as much time as you would in a college setting, where in a college setting, you could almost have like maybe three, four minutes to whatever. In a more professional setting, you have at least like, almost like an elevated pitch, where it's like you do your monologue or your scene, whatever, and then you're out the door. Like almost like the moment you're in, you're, do your scene, monologue, whatever, you're already out the door. Because people have, and like, and I could tell you, like I don't wanna go into audition stories, but there are like auditions where it's like, you spend at least an hour waiting and then you're out the door within like maybe a minute or two and then, you spent, it's like you take your whole day off for just for this one thing, just for something like that. And then essentially, okay, so what now? I was like, okay, um, I'll go get some, something to eat and then go back home, something like that. It's like, and again, it's like the business side of acting or theater in general, and especially in film, it's, a, it's something that they really should start teaching in schools. And they do have like business classes in schools. It's just that, you know, it's like one of those like pop up uh, things. Like every like every other spring is like the business side of acting, that sort of thing. So, so if if anybody's watching, if you're a college or if you see a program that says business, you know, uh, theater and business, take it. You'll probably un understand a lot more to do that. Uh, but yeah, now that you're in New York, and I kind of asked this, this the the same question yesterday. Well yesterday in the sense of me producing it. But in my previous episode, I had a, uh, an actress who actually was from Michigan, who actually transferred, you know, you know, transitioned into essentially New York after like, say, a couple of weeks. How long was essentially coming from Columbia to New York City? Like, how long did that take essentially to say, you're kind of like living the New York lifestyle? You know, quote unquote, where it's like you're, you know, you're an actress in New York City. You kind of like you have that uh, New York mentality, almost like already like gearing towards where it's like I want to do acting. I want to like I want to audition. Blah 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 blah. It's like how long did that take? Compare, uh, especially since you 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 since essentially since you know you're not uh, someone who is originally from New York. I mean, I think it took me a couple of years, to be honest. I moved here when I was 17, so I was very young. I was on my own. It was a new country. It was very hard for me just to get an apartment while being underage or, you know, tell people that I did indeed graduate high school, so they would give me a job. Um, so I had to struggle a lot with that living situation. So it took away, of course, from focusing on acting for a little bit. Uh, and I was taking acting classes since day one, but it felt like for maybe at the first year, maybe two, that's all I was really able to do was just do the classes while yeah. I got my stuff together. And then maybe after the second year, 
I felt a little bit more established. Like I had an apartment, I had a job. And then I started to take more on the business classes and um, casting workshops and agent seminars and things like that, that were a little bit more um, geared towards the business side versus just the classes that I was taking, which were still, of course, very helpful. Uh, but it just felt like they weren't getting me anywhere. Like I still didn't know who's a casting director. How do I get an agent? Things like that. Um, how do you submit to an agent or when you're seeking representation? So all of those things, even if I was very, very good about taking acting classes and technique wise, I still didn't know where to go with that. Um, so yeah, I think about two years till I started to even go into that side of the business. Yeah. And again, that brings up another uh, value point is that not only is the business side of acting not only dealing with, you know, producers, that sort of thing, it also deals with the, the actual business, like financial thing is like, as an actor living in New York City, you have to find a job, like almost a survival job. And luckily, I was able to get a survival job. And then COVID-19 kind of like put a kibosh on that. And especially since I was like waiting to, is like, if this was a normal year for me, I had just graduated and now I'm just be back to work. And I'd probably be doing this like far less, like far less doing this. But yeah, uh, as an actor, finding a, a stable job, but also finding it like a casting agent, that's like very, I won't say stressful, but it is kind of like very time consuming. Uh, were you able to essentially balance off a good, uh, yeah, balance off a good portion of like working, working your ass off and then working to find like a, uh, an agency that sort of thing? Um, no, it was definitely not balanced. I think it still took me years to really be at the point where I was ready. Um, I think that's part of it too. It's like you come here and you think you're ready, but you're not, or at least on, on my end, it wasn't like that. So I didn't know my type. I didn't have good headshots. I didn't have enough money to pay a thousand dollar headshots or um, I didn't have enough scenes for my reel. So all of those things took literally years to build up to finally be at a good point where I'm like, I know how to sell myself. Now I know I'm confident and I have all my materials ready to try to seek representation or actually go for certain roles that are not just student films, right? To like, kind of like go to that next level of your career. So it took a while. It, it, took, a, it took a little longer. So it wasn't, it didn't feel as balanced if, if that was the question. Um, because it felt like, yeah, like I wasn't ready. It would still be like, any agent seminar you would go to, they would tell you like, oh, you're missing this couple of things. Or like, this is why I wouldn't take your submission, which was great. And you know, it sounds harsh, but I needed to hear that. But even with that information, it's like, okay, it's not that easy to like, oh, cool, I'm only missing this. Let me just, you know, spend $2,000 and, you know, do it. So, <laughs> um, yeah. so it took a while to build all that up to finally um, have more scenes for a reel and have better headshots and figure out my type and, you know, everything that you pretty much need on, on that end, a website and, you know, whatever other materials you are kind of supposed to have, because it took me so long to even know what they were or how they had to be um, to finally be at a, at a place where I was more confident and knew, okay, now I can start, if that makes sense. Uh, and again, this goes back to what we were just saying before, the business side of acting, where it's like, just, just all that just happens to be a a lot to actually because the business side of acting is oh interesting is is just like you know producers that sort of thing it's much more than just producing uh so tell me uh how like what sparked you uh, when you were 12 it was like yeah you were kind of like in this performing arts program that sort of thing but was there like a particular film, TV show, that sort of thing that kind of like sparked you into acting or was it something that was like, I just want to like, it's like, like, I just want to act, that sort of thing. Um, I just loved being on stage. I went to a school that was very art um, heavy. So like the actual middle school, high school uh, in Colombia, we don't have difference. It's like one school from pre-K till graduation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it was a very, very art heavy um, school. So I did get the chance to perform a lot within school talent shows and uh, plays and things like that. And I loved it. So that's when 
I was around 12 or 13, I asked my mother to find me like a more professional one, uh, like a program, because I really wanted to do that for the rest of my life. So it's, I'm not exactly sure if I ever had like that moment, or maybe I did, I just don't remember because I was so young. Uh, but maybe even just having to ask her for that, you know, like I knew it was going to be expensive and you still have to audition to get in. Uh, again, the schedule was crazy, especially for somebody so young. Uh, like you had to pretty much go like several days after school, some days during school, every single weekend. So it was definitely very intensive and it was a lot of work. Uh, but I remember actually from the audition, like the day of the audition to even see if you would get into the program. I was very nervous because obviously that was like the first kind of big thing I was doing versus just the, my middle school or high school um, drama club. But as nervous as I was, I loved every second of it. And I left and I, I still felt great. Like I didn't feel like I wasn't as worried, like, are they going to call me or not? Because I just felt so happy to even be able to audition. Um, so I think that was kind of the moment that it, it just made me feel like, okay, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. Like I'm, this is what I want to do. So, yeah. So on top of that like, question, uh, do you kind of like have any inspirations as an actress? It, like inspirations in terms of like, you know, other, you know, other actors you kind of like admire in terms of their performances in general or just something about their performance or some of the way, uh, something about their technique that kind of like you kind of want to emulate, but at the same time, you don't want to emulate it too hard because like, it was like, oh yeah, I want, I want to be the next Brad Pitt or I just want to be the next Johnny Depp or, uh, and a lot of people who I know want to be the next Brando. So, and and they had that, and they do have that Brando mentality about, hey, you know, it's like, it's like, hey, hey, you know, that sort of like Brando mentality of, of acting, where they just want to go like full method and all that stuff, even though method acting is always, is like a whole different argument. I mean, not, I mean, a whole different conversation, but, and, and again, I'm kind of like rambling, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. In, ter in terms of your inspirations, like who do you see or who do you watch to like to get like inspired? I think that's a hard question for me to be honest because I I don't think I have that one single person. I think I go through phases where I'm just I get like kind of obsessed with one specific actress or actor. Um but then the next one comes and I'm, you know, kind of move on to the next one. So it depends. I think it, it depends. In, in the grand scheme of things, I think Meryl Streep has always been a big one, right? So mm. she's always been great. I was, she was big enough that I would see it in Colombia, right? So I would know of her even since, uh, you know, before I moved here. So she was always a, a big one. And even through her career in this most recent year, she still continues to make amazing films and crazy roles. Um, so, so I like looking into like the older actresses uh, per se just because i feel like their career has been so great that it, that alone is an inspiration like you don't have to be young and pretty to be an actor because that is not true um you mm -hmm. can do it you know your whole life and you can be a bunch of different roles um and meryl strip has always been strong about uh, not focusing on the looks which i feel like this um this industry sadly falls into that trap often and makes you feel that way so i like that she she was rejected from even auditioning for King Kong because they said she wasn't that pretty to begin yeah. with. And then it's Meryl fucking Strip, you know, <laughs> like um, amazing. So, so she's always been like a good role model in general for me, but then I see some other actors perform and I'm just, I become kind of obsessed with them. So when Michael Fassbender first started to kind of pop into the scene um, before he got too big, he was one of my favorites. I think I watched him in, Jane Eyre and it was amazing. I didn't know who he was, but I genuinely loved his performance so much that I left the movie and Googled him because I needed to know more and then watch whatever film I could find online um, with him on it. So I think that happens to me often. Like I just watch a performance and then suddenly become uh, really obsessed with them. Um, Jessica Chastain, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her last name right. Um, she is also one of those people that I saw her um, in Jolene, which I think it's on Netflix, and she was still very young, and it's like a crazy storyline where she just goes through all these awful partners, um, but she was so great in it, that same thing. I just watched whatever I could find afterwards on her, 
And it's, I like it because with both of those actors, I feel like I've been following them before they got too big, if that makes sense. So it's kind of nice because you're like with them, like you're rooting for them when they're still like in a small independent film. And then suddenly you just keep watching them grow and then they become uh, really, really famous for their work. So yeah, I think those are kind of three actors that I, I like, but again, it depends on kind of what I see because again I see a performance and then suddenly I become obsessed with it and that's my new motivation as an actor to follow yeah motivation wise it's kind of like the same thing I kind of like have two actors that kind of like are kind of uh like always sticking with me uh Oldman and Walken but then I'll be like oh, okay James Spader and then you know Robert Downey Jr you know and then other actors that would pop out, like maybe Denzel Washington, because the way he'd be like so smooth and just so casual about the type of stuff he'd be playing. And then, you know, it, it's, I think as an actor, and, a, and or rather as a performing artist, like we have these inspirations and we have these like different inspirations that we usually do to try and tune. But a lot of the times there are people who, are who essentially become too enriched in that idea where it's like they want to be that uh, not character well they want to be that character they want to be that actor when they really don't know much about that actor beforehand you know perf you know performance wise they want to like emulate that actor so much that they just start becoming that like actor uh in your experience have you seen like performers, actors, actresses that, well, I won't say like co-stars, but like people in, in the business, there we go, that kind of like emulate that to a point where it's like, I just don't know if they're kind of becoming the character or if they just want to emulate that actor so much. Um, I'm not sure if I can think about anyone specific in the business. I think it happens a lot more with actors who are, let's say, still at, like at the beginning of their career, so to speak. So obviously one of the first things you start doing, or at least I do, is like, if you see a scene you like, I wanna try it. Even if it's just a self tape, just for fun. Or if you go into an acting class and they tell you, bring a scene that you wanna do, then you obviously choose something you genuinely wanna do, but it's usually from something you've seen, done before by somebody famous. So. Yeah. The first thing they tell you is don't do it exactly like that actor because that's not the point. Even if they were the ones who got cast and they gave the performance of a lifetime, you still want to give it your take of how you would have done it, say you were auditioning for that role too, or you were given that role. So I think I see it more often in, in classes like that where they bring a scene that's clearly very recognizable and then you try to do it exactly like the actor who actually did it. And then you, that's not giving us anything new. So that's not good. It's not showing me what you're you can bring as an actor because you're trying so hard to do it so um so sometimes the best way to do it if you do choose material to use for yourself or for your classes or maybe even your reel is maybe something not as recognizable so you're not stuck with that image of what it was when it came out or if it's from a movie don't watch it so recently for when you're going to do it because then you do fall into that trap of wanting to do it like the person who did it so but i don't think i can Say that about anyone who's already kind of big in the industry that's trying to do that um, well i wasn't say like big in the industry but i meant like you know from personal experiences so but oh, yeah okay. but I think yeah I see class in classes more than in the industry like working wise uh, but sometimes i think people do fall into cliches so it's a little bit different not necessarily just like that person but um but then you may fall into a cliche where a certain character, though it might be written from a cliche standpoint, you know, you still want the character to have some depth and you want to give it your own take. So it has a bigger life than just whatever cliche the typecasting is. And then if you just stay with it, then maybe you're not giving it its full life. So that might be a similar variation on that where instead of trying to emulate a um, specific actor, you try to stick with that specific like the mean girl or something like that. You just go like cliche valley girl type of thing, but then you never come out or give it any other depth to it. Yeah. That's example. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you watch the show, but there's a show on HBO called Barry where they basically do similar thing. It's about a hitman who actually takes an acting class and, and starts falling in love with the acting. And the hitman's played by Bill Hader, and he's a, you know, he's a great comedic actor, but you know, you really hardly see anything in terms of his dramatic role because he's known for SNL that sort of thing. But when he's on the show, he's like a whole different level. And the first scene, or rather, the first episode in the season of season one is essentially what you were just saying is that how these there are actor class there are essentially beginning actor classes that basically do a lot from movies and stuff like that and it's a very like recognizable movie so i and i do think that if you are going to be doing a scene from a movie or a scene from a play it's like what you just said before take a more lesser known type of thing so otherwise, you won't be emulating that performance, but at the same time, you'd be giving it your own little personal performance. Um, in terms of your career, huh? in terms of your career, have do you have like a defining moment, or is there like a, a moment that's just like it's like your career is still building up, but you do you have essentially a uh, a moment in your like career was like, yeah, I know I've made it and I know I want to keep on doing this. Um, that's a hard question. I think that I know I made it. I don't think I'm there yet, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but I feel closer now. I feel like I said, I think uh, if you keep working on it and you keep learning more about the business, then each day I feel a little bit more confident of whatever piece of information I got. So for example, when agents tell me that, like, this is why I wouldn't, you know, take your submission or maybe switch the reel. Like one of them once told me like to put my Spanish speaking scene, the first thing in the reel versus wherever else I had it. So even little things like that already make me a better candidate, you know, when it comes to auditioning or finding representation. So I feel like there's always more stuff to do. So maybe that's not the best way to describe if I've made it or not, because I feel like I have so much room to improve still. But it does feel good when I've gotten a lead role, right? Like, I mean, at least for myself, I don't always get the lead. Um, so whenever I do get the lead or like a bigger character, that obviously feels good. So it's, and it's not validation necessarily, but it's more like, I know I can do it. And finally, I get to do it type of thing. Like I knew all along, I just needed the chance to finally do it. And now whatever production I'm doing right now with a bigger role, then I feel good. Um, even as a Latina actress, then it feels good to get the lead because even just in that standpoint, it's like, am I being stereotyped as like the sexy Latina or am I actually be being given a good enough role or the lead in something? So that's always one of those moments that feels good to me. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answered the question, but essentially when I get a, a bigger role, so to speak, in terms of credits, it feels good. Yeah, I think that actually makes a lot of sense because to me, you know, and it's, and this actually just brings up another good question is typecasting is that, you know, when I'm usually auditioning, people just use, and I've actually had people say, hey, you know, I know you're auditioning for the lead role or but I kind of want you to go as the best friend or as the professor or as the teacher, you know, because one, I wear glasses, you know, I can't help it. You know, it's, it's just part of my look. It's part of my, the fact that I have poor eyesight, you know, I can't see far away. I can see up close, but far away, <laughs> but, and the ice and the eyeglasses always give me a, a an air, uh, an aurora of authoritarian, that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, typecasting, I, I believe, is something that it, it is still happening in, in the business in acting. So, in your experience, like compared to, it's like, I know starting out, what you just said before is like, you know, you, people was like, oh, put your Spanish up front, you know, have your like that sort of thing. But compared to then to now, do you feel like typecasting is still a thing? Because I know that, you know, movies and TV shows are actually exploring more and more with, um, uh, I would just say, unconventional casting, where it's like you have more unknown people essentially taking lead roles, you know, that sort of thing. In the Star Wars, the new Star Wars trilogy, 
the three new lead roles were played by John Boyega, Daisy Ridley, and Oscar, uh, Oscar Isaac, you know, three people who beforehand, you know, two, you know, two of which were essentially kind of like unknown stars in uh, the UK, but at least with Oscar, you know, Oscar Isaac, you know, he kind of like, you know, made his uh, name in like independent movies, you know, Collins, you know, Colin Brown movies, like that sort of thing. So between how you started, right, like when you first started out to like now, do you still see the typecasting still happening or is it a struggle or like it's there, but it's like kind of going away, but still at the same time, there's still people taking a Advantage of that, like, uh, you know, care, uh, gimmicks or that sort of thing. I mean, I think the thing about typecasting is that it can be good. It's not always a bad thing. It's good to know what you can cast for, almost as a sure thing, because then you know if you go to those type of auditions, then you have a higher chance of getting that role. Period. Uh, whereas if it's something that you don't usually cast for, then obviously it's going to be a little bit harder, and you have to you know, make sure you're really confident and make strong choices to convince the casting director that you could do something that is not necessarily in your wheelhouse. And when I say wheelhouse, I don't mean performance wise, but I mean that they would actually consider you for. Um, so I think there is a little bit more diversity. I think when I first moved here, there was definitely much more of you know, I think both Sam Hayek and Penelope Cruz are great actresses, but they are known for being just like the sexy Latina actress and that's it. And you don't really consider as much like their actual performances and they've done amazing, amazing things because the more popular things or the newer things, they still do kind of like the sexy wife or, you know, something like that. They don't get portrayed um, that well, so to speak, as like a deeper character. Um, so... So it can be bad in that sense. So I think it's it's a little bit more open now, but I still think that it needs a little bit of work. So I think there is more diversity and I have gotten the lead as a Latina actress. So that makes me feel good. That truly means like, okay, so maybe you were saying Caucasian or you didn't have a specific ethnicity, yet you chose to give it to somebody, you know, um, of a different background than whatever the, the female lead would be usually in a sort of, romantic you know role or something like that so so it's a good thing because then you know what you can go for but again you the problem with typecasting also is like okay sure part of the breakdown of the character is you know a specific ethnicity but are you giving it anything else is the writing actually good is the character you know doing something more than just what it's described as um so i think that's where really the problem lies on typecasting is like you could still, like you say, you get, you know, like professor or, you know, academic things that could be really powerful and you can go for, you know, certain things there. But if you are, if the writing, it's not letting you really, you know, give the character alive and it's just kind of like a stereotype then that's obviously a problem. So, so I think it's getting a little better, but I, I don't think we're there yet. If that answers <laughs> the question with typecasting, I think as an actor though, it's a good thing to know what you get typecast. And I don't think you should fight it as much, especially when you're starting out, because that's gonna help you. If that's what you cast for, then you gotta use it. You gotta milk it, you know, to at least get in the rooms that you need to get into. And then once you're a little bit more established, then that's when you have a little bit more luxury of maybe choosing the roles versus I'm auditioning for anything and everything, right? So, so I think it can be used to our advantage, but I think on the writing side, there's definitely still work to do with writing deeper characters when you give them specific ethnicities or, or typecasting, because it can just be that. Yeah, and I do agree that, that, that typecasting, there is a civil lining in terms of, hey, we kind of know what role you are looking for in terms of just portraying whatever character, but there were actors who kind of like, I mean, there are like a sense of performance or something like that who who kind of like do the same role over and over again. And that's sort of like their, like their stick. So, and that's when I kind of like mean my tag casting. But, and, and, and again, there is, it, it's sort of like the, the good, bad inside of type casting, where it's like the good is what you all just meant, what you just mentioned. But the bad is there are, 
essential performance will kind of like fall into a, that little niche of just not playing the same different roles because they feel much more of a, a joy of being that like uh, that character. Um, it's a good thing one. So I have two questions left and granted those two questions might uh, stem from uh, another question or two depending on how articulating everything but <laughs> since and I won't beat around the uh, bus around the subject but since COVID-19 happened and like entertainment has been in a standstill do you have anything in the pipeline in the foreseeable future or are you kind of like waiting for things just like just essentially just to die down for entertainment wise where I could just like hey go back to normal or something like that so LA has been pretty active in my opinion even before they open production which they are already up and running which is crazy but real <laughs> uh, production offices casting offices everything is open um, in LA so I think I, I definitely saw a difference between LA and New York in type and in, in terms of how active they were being like agents were a little bit more accessible so that they were taking new clients or they were reviewing submissions casting directors were also you know doing open calls in general so they could meet new actors to put in their roster so I think they actually stayed pretty busy, even if production specifically wasn't happening. I don't think the business died or stopped completely. So I've been lucky to be able to audition quite a lot, thanks to all those things. And because it's COVID, then also means that I in New York can audition for LA things because everything is self-submission and self-taped. So I don't have to worry if they'll, you know, that I have to fly or obviously, you know, go to their office in person. Um, so that's been a great opportunity for me and I've been using it, of course, to keep auditioning, um, but also more as in terms of like networking. So I feel like bigger names in casting in the casting industry became more accessible. So the fact that you as someone who maybe you don't have representation and you don't have anyone to get you in the room and pitch you, maybe your credits are not up there. And then there's still big casting directors giving you a general meeting so you can still be on the roster, you know? So, so I think that's a great thing with COVID. I think it hasn't, for me at least, it hasn't slowed down because in LA it didn't slow down, if that makes sense. So I've been able to be pretty active on that end. I've submitted to a lot of things, still haven't heard from a couple, but I think things were still moving in the audition process. So then I've been taking also this time to look for new representation because agents, again, are, are slightly less busy, so they're more accessible and they're actually giving new actors and new faces a chance to meet and submit. So that's what I've been focusing more on. Mm -hmm. uh, every single open call or general, whether a casting uh, or an agent office, as well as working on all my submission materials to look for new representation. In terms of auditioning, that sort of thing, uh... I know there's backstage, I know there's Actors Access, and I know there's a slim chance people actually still use Playbill, like the job postings on Playbill, because uh, I'm not sure if the job, bill, uh, job postings on Playbill, like it's active anymore in, in terms of, because I know like a couple of years ago it was fairly active, but now with the, the rise of, I, I wanna say backstage and Actors Access, do you see like, do you have a preference to say which is actually more better in terms of those? Uh, uh... Yes, I think, and I don't mean to shit on backstage, but I think backstage is a little bit like on the lower end, as in small, <laughs> like anybody can post in it. It can be like super small things. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes you can get, you know, like bigger projects out of there. But A, it is definitely more targeted to theater, I want to say um than actors access and b i think that in my personal experience also i'm just genuinely talking personal experience here backstage is just more like student films for very very small budget and, and um non-union things actors access still has non-union projects as well but i feel like for the bigger projects like more bigger names bigger production houses actual networks 
you can get a, lo a lot more on actors axes. And um, if you, so I've been also watching a lot of Instagram lives because pretty much every casting director and agent are using their um, Instagram to do live Q and A's and things like that, which again, is very, very valuable information. But on top of that, that's where you know, hey, I'm holding a casting call and there usually are on actors access for you to submit. Mm -hmm. so pretty much every person that's opened, yeah, like on open calls or submissions, they ask for uh, an eco cast tape via actor access. Um, casting Frontier is another good one. In my opinion, it's also another kind of like with actors access, like in that tier. So backstage, I think is a little bit more for if you're a very, the beginner stage is good because then you can get student films or things like that. If you don't have that many credits or if you don't have an agent, actors access, I feel like it just has a little bit more I call them like chunkier roles or chunkier productions. So they have a bigger budget and it's, it's just a little bit better in, in that sense. And a lot of these uh, things are free to join. It's just that you need to pay like, you know, $1, two dollars a month, maybe. Or You're not maybe I don't think I've ever oh. had one, but I pay for everything. <laughs> I have oh. to pay for backstage. I pay for actors access. I pay for, Casting Frontier, I pay for LA Casting, I pay for every casting about, like pretty much every single thing has, unfortunately, a subscription, but that's where you get the roles. If you don't have an agent, then you're self-submitting, you have to have those, um, at least two of them, you know, you need to have that access. And it sucks, it sucks that you have to pay for everything. Acting, I think it's a very expensive career. You always have to pay for classes, you have to pay for seminars, you have to pay for workshops, for headshots, for reels. So it is definitely very, very expensive, sadly, but it's an investment because it is helping you if you know how to use it right and you know how to market yourself, then you can actually get money off of it. So if you pay, I mean, I don't even know how much it is anymore because I just, you know, have it on <laughs> on my card, everything's automatic. But if I pay $60 a year for Actors Access, but then make $1,000 in a couple of months, then that's not bad from Actors Access, if that makes sense. So, oh, so yes. it, it, it can be helpful if, if you know, you're able to get things. Um, I should also say as a tip on Actors Access specifically, you should definitely have a slate shot, which is you saying your name on tape. Uh, because if you have a slate shot and if you don't have actors access the way it works, you can, you can put this, the slate shot with your headshot. So whenever a casting director is going to open a headshot, it has the option to also see the slate tape. So those get to the top of the list. Mm. So it's good to have that. Otherwise you probably won't even get seen because obviously that's hundreds, if not thousands of submissions. So anything that has the video of the slate will definitely go up higher on their on their list when they're looking at the submission and on that note uh yeah the uh those websites are very great to uh, as a great resource especially as a working actor and i should point out there are also people who kind of like take advantage of that and do like the cast and scam so i won't name those names but you know who they are but for my last question is a very important one uh, do you have any of, and this kind of like links back to what we were just saying, especially those casting uh, scams, but do you have any advice to the uh, people watching right now slash listening right now? I think education, it's a big thing. You know, I was not able to afford college and sometimes I, you know, a lot of times I'm like, well, it's fine because I'm an actress, so it's not like I needed college necessarily. And maybe I, I didn't in a sense, but I do mean that you have to work on your craft because if you, I think a lot of times we get maybe too cocky, right? It's like, well, I already did four years of, you know, a theater school or I went to London and studying like this amazing theater school or whatever. So then I'm ready and that's it. And that's all I need. And I'm good to go. But you're not, you have to keep working on it all the time. I mean, if you actually, Again, I think Instagram has been great. So you should definitely go on Instagram and try to follow any casting directors or agents because they are doing amazing live Q and A's. A lot of them are interviewing prominent actors that are on, you know, series regulars on TV and such, and they still get coached and they still take classes. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not 
it doesn't stop just because you booked a bigger role even. So I think working on your craft as well as working on the business, I think those both have to be uh, on par. And like, when you think about it, I've, I've heard it said a lot in, in agent seminars and such is that an agent or a manager, they take 10% of, you know, whatever you make of a project. So technically they're only doing 10% of the work and you have to do 90% of it. Yeah. So also I think we get complacent like, well, I got an agent, I'm good. And then you don't do any work because you think that your agent or your manager is supposed to do that. But again, they take 10% of the check. So therefore they're only doing 10% of the work and you have to do the other 90. So I think it's important to work on both your craft and don't get complacent with that as well as work on the business side, because without the business knowledge, sadly, you will never be able to get in the casting rooms that you need to. And with that, I believe is a good dropping off point for this episode. Thank you to those who have been watching. Oh, before I go, do you have any social medias you want to plug out? Oh, sure. Thank you. My full name is Alexandra Bernal. So my Instagram, it's Alexandra Bernal official. Mm -hmm. And my website is alexandrabernal.com. All right. And... This has performed in the arts. Don't forget to like, subscribe, sub to this channel. Uh, this is just a work in progress. <laughs> I kid, but thank you again, Alexandra, thank for you. take for essentially taking the time out of your busy day. I know it's like a very busy day, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for those who have been watching. My name has been Brian, and I'm Brian M. Davis, your friendly little host. Take care, everyone. <laughs>